Now we're coming to the experiment on the rotating drum. And I said at the beginning this was a fluid stack type of experiment. It is and it isn't. And we're going to see there's elements of both in here and we're going to see both in action. So the theory is fairly simple, but for some reason many students have a hard time getting their head around it. So I'm going to try to explain this in this clear as I can. All right, let's consider a, and I'll do this in cross section, a bowl. A bowl is it's round this way, flat on the bottom, flat on the top. And I apply a um, omega a rotation, and I bring it to a constant rotation, I bring it up to rotational speed, I constantly bring it up to a seven. If I do this, and the, the theory is a, can be done in a number of ways, I will end up with, well, it actually, it should be symmetric. Well, the bowl. Now, how is that bowl defined? First, let's look at this. Let's put a central axis here. And let's suppose that I have some kind of datum at the top. Now, this I think is where most students kind of miss it because they're used to having a coordinate system either with the datum in the corner or the datum in the middle. Um, Dave at the top. Okay, and let's suppose that the steady state this is the z-axis and this is z naught. The distance between the very bottom of the bolt, the center line, and here. Now, let's take an arbitrary point R. Let's say it's R1, and that would be C1. Let's take an arbitrary point R2. Now these are radiuses from the center. This distance from the same datum is Z2. And then we have R3. Oops, well, it's okay. Z3. Okay, if I know the omega, and by the way, I have had students who have gone through this experiment and have, much to their horror, realized at the end they forgot to measure omega. So, but anyway, omega is a constant. The location of each of these points, Z and let's say Z N, is equal to Z naught, which is a constant, minus R N omega, which is a constant for the whole thing, squared over two Jesus C. Okay. Okay. Now that is the um, that you and if you can predict no if you know this you know this is a constant and for each any arbitrary r you can have you know z the z ones and then you can assuming this is all measured from the same data you can determine this parabola. The first thing you're going to do is once you bring the rotating drum up to speed is to pick a number of points, usually three, minimum four is more likely for this. And you'll measure this distance from here to here, and this to here, this, and of course you measure this one. And then you'll be able to compute it. Now, what, what you'll end up with is
and you go with the ZI theoretical is this value, and then you'll be able to. And you could plot those two against each other, which probably is the, there's two ways to do it. One of them is you can plot, you could actually do a parabolic interpolation. We talked about that earlier, we the second order interpolation, and compare it to the theoretical. Or you could Z theoretical versus Z actual, that should be a line. They should be equal in, in, in theory. In reality, they won't be equal. There'll be differences. And so you can plot that and see how good your results are or how not so hot your results are. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing we do is we want to know what the velocity. Now, is of the fluid at any given point. Now, the velocity, the um, tangential velocity of a fluid at, at point is r omega. And by the way, if this was a solid, it's the same thing. You have a flywheel, it rotates omega, the velocity, the, the tangential velocity is any point is is equal to the radius from the central point out to whatever point you're thinking about times its rotational speed. And so basically we, can, we can compute for R1 is equal to R1 omega, R2 omega, R3 omega. We can compute the tangential velocity for any of these. And now, how do we do it experimentally? This is where the pitot tube. I have a little piece on how the pitot tube works. In this particular experiment, what you're going to see is something like this. It's a little tube, and then you've got this graduated clear. And the idea is, and there's number, is that say the water level is right above the level. Of the, and, and the vol and this well actually is u which I'll explain later. The velocity is going in like this. Um, and the, what you'll see is when that happens, you'll see that within the tube, up somewhere, at a distance l from the surface of the water, is the Lot is, is the, the tube will rise. And the U can be estimated basically the same equation you use when you drop something in the floor. In other words, the faster the velocity, the higher this column. And you can measure this U at R, R1, R2, R3, and um, and you can actually measure these L's. You can take these L's, and you can do the same thing here. Just an R omega, one, two, three, and then you, L one. L2. And again, these are this set of R's can be the same or different than that. Doesn't make any difference whether they're one or the other. Now, I snuck in a change in notation, and I'm going to explain what it is. Actually, why did I call velocity U? And if that's the case, because that's a CFD convention. And you may have seen it in your fluid mechanics course, and you may not. But basically, let's see, and then u in the x, if it's, it's v in the y direction, and it's w in the z direction, we don't do much three-dimensional stuff, so it's going to be u and v. And that's a, that, that's a convention from uh, CF, computational fluid dynamics that I kind of use and I kind of let it sneak into my, this course without anybody asking me to do it. But I did it anyway. 
That's simple. You, you, you construct this table, and again, as the case with that table, if everything is perfect, then the um, you then this will be the same. Then these these two columns should be identical. If it's not, you plot a linear. You can in both cases you can plot at best least squares linear fit. You can note the differences. You can find out why the difference. One thing I was two things I will note. One of them is that you should always include at both points. At, you know, you, well you can include it. You don't have to. Um, one one thing is probably the velocity is going to be zero at this point, and the z is equal to z naught because r is zero. So that's a legit point in for both velocity and for this being z naught. In other words, the first point z naught. The other thing I will just warn you: you can do that. Um, that might anchor is because the second problem is is that the smaller radii tend to have the worst data. This is one place where a one norm optimization or one norm correlate cor residuals would be a big, big help, but we don't really kind of have that available to us. So we have Z naught, Z naught, and then these will be kind of iffy. So it might make a little bit better sense to anchor the both of these tape these at zero zero or z naught z naught in this case zero zero over here z naught z naught over here. So that's pretty much the, all the theory, and that's basically what you need to do when you do this lab. So we're going to stop here. We're going to go with lab, and we're going to actually run this. This experiment. is the rotating drum, cylindrical. Filled up about halfway with water off to the right, it's hard to see, but it's there, is the power supply for it. So let's go ahead and get started and see if we can bring this thing up to speed. Before we actually get to taking measurements, I want to give you kind of the lay of the land on this. First of all, you in, in bringing this thing up to speed, there are two things you want to avoid. The first is to actually slosh water out of the bowl. Uh, students, when this happens, students find it highly entertaining, but it doesn't really add much to the experiment. And the second thing you want to avoid is for the bot the very bottom of the bowl to expose a little knot at the bottom a little knot at the bottom of the bowl which actually transmits the torque from the motor up to the ball. And the reason why you do that is because the equations that you are using assume that that is underwater. You, you do that, you actually violate the assumptions of the equations. One of the things that gets engineers into trouble when they apply equations is that they do not understand the, the uh, assumptions under which the equations are are made in the conditions under which they're intended to be used and as a result they end up uh, making uh, they end up making mistakes and they wonder why that's why you cannot blindly apply any equation or methodology without having some basic understanding 
of both its its origins and also its strengths and weaknesses and what it was actually made for. So with that, there are two things. One of them is this. This is a slider across the front. You see this is graduated down to zero, which is the middle, and graduated back up. And I know you're going to see a lot of graduated stuff here, and some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I wish I'd graduate. Well, we're working on that. But in any event, you come up, if you line this up with the zero, you're in the middle. That's the first thing. Oops, let's get it right where it's supposed to be. Here, okay. Now at this, this is also graduated, and it is the distance from, if you place this down, and this is at the center, this is my Z naught, actually. There we go. And I place this down in such a way that sooner or later it's going to touch the water. And it's kind of, I have to look at it from this direction. Sometimes I, if I'm in a slipstream I can usually tell. If not, I have to go down, I have to look into the bowl and see it. So therefore, the distance my since this is my ref datum point right here, the distance from this mark down to there is my Z naught because it's in the middle. Any other radius I pick, and I'm going to pick three of them, is between here and here are radiuses which I'm going to take measurements at. So this is R naught, this is my Z naught. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and take several. Well, the other thing I want to look at is this. This is my pedostatic tube. I'm not going to put this in the holder just yet, but basically what I'm going to do here is if I take this and I place this just barely in the water, you'll notice that the water rises in the tube, which it should. And basically the velocity at that point is, and I'm not holding this very well, so it's varying on me, the velocity at that point is 2 times g times l. Take a square root of that. And that's my velocity at that point. You point this into the slipstream, you do it just below the surface to get rid of your datum problem, at least minimize it, and then you take your measurements. So we're going to go ahead and take a series of measurements in this, and we'll see how they, how they work out. And when, of course, you take this out, the water flows back in. So there. We've taken three data points. We took them at the radius. The first one is 8 centimeters, the second is 13 centimeters, and the last one is 18 centimeters from the center. And of course, we took the data at the center. We did not take Peter to the data at the center because obviously at the center, the velocity is zero. So, I'm going to go run this thing one more time before I shut down in case you missed uh, an opportunity Remember, you have to convert what RPM, which is normally what you would do, into radians per second. So, with all that, I want to thank you for watching. God bless.